Hello and welcome to another Piper Pod. Today we're going to look at urinary physiology and most importantly we're going to look at the homeostatic relationship that the renal system has in controlling a lot of our balances, our blood pressure, our electrolyte balances, acid base balances. So we're going to go through focusing a lot on the nephron itself and looking at how different aspects of the body help regulate these functions. So first of all, a bit of an overview. The renal system, and in particular the urinary filtration aspect, is responsible for the filtration of all plasma, separation of waste, but also the reabsorption and elimination of certain substances depending on what the body needs. And with that, it obviously controls our blood volume and takes care of our osmolarity that we hold within ourselves. The kidney also produces a couple of hormones, so renin, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the regulation of blood pressure, erythropoietin, responsible for the formation of red blood cells, and calcitroin, which is essentially our vitamin D, steroid hormone. On top of that, the kidney is our main metabolic uh, organ, it's responsible in regulating acid base and it's also really useful at detoxifying uh, if your body has a whole bunch of free radicals or broken down cellular structure or certain medications it's the kidneys that's responsible for the detoxification and the secretion of those substances from our body so when you look at urine formation, it can be broken down into four different steps. And obviously we'll go through each step in details, but just as a means of overview, we have glomerulus filtration at the Bowman's capsule, tubule reabsorption and tubule secretion, pretty much within the same structures. And then we finish at uh, concentration, which is where we decide whether or not we want to keep the water in there or remove the existing water uh, that's in place and that's the whole process and this is what takes place in the nephron itself that's found in the kidney so let's break each one of those steps down and then we'll bring in a little bit of electrolyte and acid based knowledge as we need to so the first step is glomerulus filtration now this is highly dependent on your high hydrostatic pressure so as the blood comes in through the arterioles within the kidneys himself it comes in under a massive hydrostatic pressure now when the fluid and the solutes get pushed through under that hydrostatic pressure we have a low osmotic pressure present in the fluid that's pushed through because large molecules like blood cells and proteins can't be pushed through okay so they're too big to be pushed through which gives us our low osmotic draw on the inside now what keeps the water and the solutes within the capsule itself is the capsule has its own osmotic pressure which is, doesn't allow any reabsorption of fluid or solutes within the Bowman's capsule itself. Okay, so anything smaller than our three units in size will pass freely through the membrane. As you can see the pitch to the right, it's a highly fenestrated uh, structure uh, that allows fluid and solutes to pass freely through it under pressure. And that's what happens first at our glomerulus filtration, right at the edge of the Bowman's capsule. So when we look at a glomerulus filtration rate, it really means the amount of fluid that passes through the actual glomerulus. So therefore the amount of fluid that is actually produced per minute is what the glomerulus filtration rate is. Now on average, you should have about 120 mils of fluid passing through the glomerulus uh, every minute. Now, that doesn't mean there's 125 mils of urine that's going to be produced per minute, obviously, otherwise we'd do nothing but live on the toilet, but that's the amount of plasma-based fluid that passes through the glomerulus in any minute. So that means the average person has about 180 litres of fluid passed into their kidneys each day. Now, in a normal state, normal healthy body, on average, 99% of everything that is pushed through 
is reabsorbed, which means you know anywhere between one to two liters of urine is produced a day. Now, at the lamellulus itself, it has some very clever structures surrounding it, very specialized chemical receptors and baroreceptive cells around the glomerulus head that allows the renal to actually auto-regulate based on the pressure coming in. So if the arterial pressure is anywhere between 75 and 175 millimeters of mercury, the actual glomerulus structure can alter the amount of blood that comes in by either opening up the vessels, allowing more blood flow through in, this, in times of low blood pressure, or reducing the amount of blood that will actually come through in times of high blood pressure. Because obviously if the high blood pressure was able to bust through, then it will cause destruction and you'll get a lot more proteins basically would come through, and then blood will come through, that sort of thing. Same too if the blood pressure was too low, then your hydrostatic pressure wouldn't be high enough in order to push the fluids through. So it's not perfect. You can obviously have things like pre-renal failure and destruction, but it does have its own internal autoregulatory system that controls the amount of blood flow that comes into the glomerulus head, just for your knowledge. Okay, so once all the fluid is pushed in to the kidney, then we start our reabsorption process. Now the proximal convoluted tubules are the main area in which reabsorption and excretion occurs. Okay, so 65% of all the filtrates that have been pushed through are returned to the blood within the proximal tubule area itself. Okay, so a vast majority. Now this area, like most of them, is held together by epithelial cells, just really small epithelial cells, and they have a lot of microvilli within them too. Now this sort of helps facilitate movement of the fluid, but it also contains specialized protein structures that allow for reabsorption that we'll look into in just a little bit. So the main factors working on the actual proximal end is osmosis. So obviously when we look at osmosis, we're talking about the concentration of solutes. Okay, so if we have something that's um, low osmotic uh, value, so therefore it has a low osmotic draw, it's not going to have any pulling power towards it, whereas something that has a high osmotic draw is going to draw fluids into it. Okay, so when something is low osmolarity, it generally means that it's high in water concentration, and if it's a high osmolarity, it's generally low in water concentration. So osmotic pressure is associated with drawing power. Now, I just wanted to bring that up quickly because that's a, what the main aspect of the proximal tubules and the subsequent structures work on uh, when we're dealing with reabsorption uh, and secretion sometimes. So it's the solvent drag that allows for most of the water and solvents to be absorbed in the proximal tubules. So if you think about the glomerulus head as it pushes through, it is going to get rid of a lot of water and a lot of small solutes themselves. Okay, your electrolytes, your glucose, amino acids, uh, nitrogenesis weights, you know, they're all very small structures. What's going to stay in the blood itself is a whole bunch of albumin, large protein, give the blood around the actual capillaries within the, the nephrons themselves a high colloid osmotic pressure. And what that will do is it will physically draw water via osmosis from the tubules back into the bloodstream. Okay, so that's where most of the absorption factors come from. But there are a lot more specialized structures that occur, um, especially within the proximal head, that we'll talk about. But this is just the main drawing power. The other transporters within the proximal head is our active transport of sodium. So sodium channels with the sodium potassium pump are activated in the proximal tubules as well. So that will use energy in order to push sodium into the bloodstream itself. Now, Believe it or not, uh, the kidneys are responsible, during rest anyway, in using about 20 to 25% of our oxygen that, that we breathe in. 
Okay, so the kidneys use a lot of oxygen because they need a lot of energy when dealing with active transport. Okay, now a lot of the reabsorption of specialized molecules is done by active transport and a lot of the secretions are done by active transport as well. So a lot of energy is used, therefore at rest we need a lot of oxygen as well. So sodium potassium pump occurs and the cool thing about the sodium potassium pump is because we have secondary active transport of other nutrients is we have specialized protein structures on the microvilli that allow glucose, amino acids and other nutrients like calcium, things like that to piggyback on the sodium itself. So it piggybacks onto the sodium uh, line with, with the specialized protein and it actively transports glucose, amino acids and other nutrients. So it is not normal to find glucose and amino acids within or proteins within the actual urine itself. Okay, because of this secondary active transport piggybacking that occurs. Now if you do end up finding them in the urine, it means that it's exceeded what's known as your, your total reabsorption value that can occur. So glucose, if it's anything over 10 millimoles of glucose that is secreted through, then it can only pick up so much. There's only so many transport channels available, meaning some of the glucose is, is going to get through. So that's basically how we end up with these things in our urine. Now, because of this sodium active transport and this other secondary um, active transports that's occurring, this is going to actually encourage additional osmosis. Okay? Because sodium is the electrolyte with the biggest osmotic draw, calcium amino acids also have some as well as glucose, we're gonna draw fluid with those active transport molecules as well. Okay, so the electrolytes will actually draw fluid, which is osmosis as well. On top of that, because of all these cations that are being absorbed, mostly sodium, we're actually going to get absorption of anions like chloride because of the electrostatic attraction between negative anions associated with cation draw. Okay, that's something known as you know the J drift. So obviously you've got your os modic draw, but then you also have your proposing electrostatic attraction as well. On top of that, I know we've gone through a lot, but on top of that, if you have larger structures or larger solutes that are found within the tubules themselves, then the actual area can go through endocytosis, so actually capsulize that particular protein and bring it back into the blood itself. So all very specialized structures. Okay, once we finish the proximal tubules, the urine heads down the loop of Henle. Now the loop of Henle is broken up into two different areas and the thickness of these areas alter as you're going along. So the main purpose of the loop of Henle is to increase the ionized concentration values that is found within the blood itself. Okay, so the descending loop of Henle allows for osmosis of water based on purely osmotic gradients, but the thick ascending side of the loop of Henle doesn't allow for water, and it actively pushes out salts into the actual um, environment, into the extracellular fluid surrounding it, creating a high osmotic value on the outside, and what that does is it allows for uh, concentration of the urine later on when we get to the collecting ducts themselves. So that's the purpose of the loop of Henle is it to overload, if you will, the concentration of solutes within the extracellular fluid next to the collecting ducts, which we'll talk about later on. Now once we get to the distal tubules, uh, most of the fluid and the solutes have been absorbed but it still has about 20% of the water and 10% of the solutes that are left from the original glomerulus filtration rate. Now the difference between the distal uh, tubules compared to the proximal tubules is that they this area here is subject to hormonal control. So it's the hormones within our body that it will regulate additional uptake of water 
sodium, um, pot potassium, whatever it may be, it's the hormonal control that will occur. Now, like the uh, proximal tubule, this is also the place that a lot of wastes are being excreted in as well. But just to have a look at the hormonal control of the distal tubules, we obviously have aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is activated by a few things. So it's activated by the renin angiotensive aldosterone uh, pathway. So in the presence of a low blood pressure or a activation of reduction in stretch fibers, things like that will release renin, angiotensive 2, and then aldosterone can be released. It can also be released in a response to chemoreceptors if it picks up a reduction in sodium concentration or an increase in potassium concentration within the blood. So what aldosterone will do in the distal tubules, it will increase the amount of sodium and therefore water that is absorbed in the distal tubules, but it will also push in potassium to be secreted as part of the solutes. So that obviously helps regulate sodium levels, regulates potassium levels, and obviously maintains our volume and blood pressure. Now it's true, if we have too much sodium, then the atrial neutrinic peptide kicks in, and that comes from the myocardium, and it's usually associated with high blood pressure, with sodium having such a high osmotic draw. This peptide increases the amount of sodium, and therefore water, excreted by the body. So both of those control the distal tubules uh, associated with absorption. Now, when we look at secretions, we just need to look at that first because it happens mostly in the proximal tubules and the distal tubules. Now, the secretion of chemicals can be done via concentration gradients and can also be done via uh, active transport. So your nitrogenesis waste, like a urea, your uric acid, it will be mostly be moved into the filtrates in order to be excreted. Okay, other things like your creatine will also be excreted and any form of other waste products. Now this is also where a higher concentration of drugs, so once drugs have been metabolized and they have waste products, this is where uh, these will be excreted as well. Now on top of that, this is also the areas which helps regulate our acid base balance okay so the secretion of a certain acid base um, substance obviously goes hand in hand with the absorption of another but it is controlled by the kidneys itself so just having a closer look at that we'll look at what happens in the body if it is acidotic now co2 being obviously one of our gas that can travel within our plasma itself, so it can get passed through into the kidney. Now I know there's not a lot of CO2 in the blood, only about 1.5%, but it can be passed through. Now that combines with the CO2 that is already being produced by the metabolic energy production within the Krebs cycle, so they bind together. And it goes through the formation of carbonic acid with the age of our carbonic anhydronase. Now from there, obviously, it goes through its disassociation process where it becomes a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion from there. Now in the case of acidosis, what happens is, is the body will excrete extra hydrogen ions and with it a chloride and it will push out a bicarbonate ion and a sodium ion into the extracellular fluid in order to act as a bicarbonate buffer. Okay, so in the event of acidosis, the breakdown, hydrogen will be excreted with chloride and bicarbonate and sodium will be absorbed into the extracellular fluid to be picked up by the blood and used again as another buffer. Now obviously, the opposite occurs when we're dealing with alkalosis. We still have the same substances, starting with our CO2 plus water, making carbonic acid, breaking down into bicarbonate and hydrogen. But this time, we remove just a bicarbonate ion in, into the tubule fluid, 
and we push a hydrogen ion and chloride into the extracellular fluid itself. Therefore, being able to utilize and decrease the pH from its alkalotic state. Okay, so that's what happens in the tubules themselves. So like I said, the proximal and the distal tubules have a strong role to play in our acid-base regulation. Okay, obviously in conjunction with our respiratory systems as well. Finally, after everything is done, we finally get to the collecting ducts. Now it's the collecting ducts that is, will determine the concentration of our urine itself. So when we think about the collecting ducts, we have what has been excreted into the extracellular fluid from a whole bunch of nephrons. Now this, in turn, obviously has a massive osmolarity value within the extracellular fluid because of the presence of sodium chloride and urea that has been pushed into the extracellular space. Okay, so that's, that's there. So that will obviously have a huge driving power within the cortex of the collecting duct itself. Once we get down to the medullary aspect of the collecting ducts, so just to define the difference, the cortex means the outer ring of your kidney itself and then the cortex is the darker media part of it where the branch of the looper handling and the collecting duct will sit. Okay, so it's in this region that the cellular structure of the collecting ducts change and it's no longer permeable to sodium chloride but it is permeable to water but only in the presence of the antidiuretic hormone will actually determine how permeable the collecting ducts are. So when we look at our antidiuretic hormone, obviously it's produced in the posterior pituitary gland within the brain, and it's activated on drive from what's known as the hypothalamic osmolotic regulator. And it's a very, very sensitive aspect of, of the hypothalamus. It just pick up a one to 2% change in osmotic um, value within the blood and it activates your thirst receptors, but it also activates your um, antidiuretic hormone. So if you're fully hydrated, therefore in a quite a dilute state, very low osmotic draw, then you will not secrete an antidiuretic hormone. Okay, and the absence of an antidiuretic hormone means that the permeability of water is very low. Therefore water stays in the collecting duct and is excreted via the urine. Now, if you're dehydrated, therefore your osmotic pressure is very high, then the brain will, will secrete, the pituitary, posterior pituitary gland will secrete a large amount of antidiuretic hormone, which increases the permeability and allows for water to be drawn out via osmosis and the urine becomes more concentrated. Okay, and that's the final role and what determines our concentration of our urine right at the end of the process itself. So when we look at urine, urine should be clear, it shouldn't have any blood, it should have the smallest amount of protein, if not uh, none, and any changes to this color or smell or anything like that could mean that there's some form of a solute. If you produce too much, it's called polyuria. If you don't produce much, it's called oliguria, which means that uh, you're not producing a lot, and it could mean that your body is building up with um, extra toxins, which is obviously not the best. Now, when we look at the concentration of values that you'll find in urine, obviously our body is extremely selective. So there's certain things in our body that our body doesn't need a large amount of, but it produces a large amount as well. So urea is a byproduct of protein metabolism, so therefore, and is also highly linked to ammonia and nitrogenous rate. So it's produced, it's found in the blood plasma, but pretty much all of it is secreted. Okay, same with uric acid. Uric acid is generated by the breakdown of nucleic acid. Now, nucleic acid is the genetic material. So once that gets broken down, it produces a uric acid, and that needs to be secreted as well. Creatine, very useful in creatine phosphate system, 
but we tend to produce and excrete a lot as our muscle you know break down and get utilized throughout the day so again a lot of it can be excreted okay and then we start looking at our electrolytes okay we get a lot of potassium in our diet but it needs to be tightly regulated so generally speaking on a normal day normal process we will actually excrete more potassium in the urine that is actually generally found within the blood okay most of the potassium that you find will be found within the cell meaning if any is leaking out through different metabolic processes it is often removed and excreted now the opposite occurs with our chloride sodium and protein there are large amounts of these are found in the actual blood itself and we need them okay proteins themselves can't get through the kidneys so very very little actually gets taken out and chloride and sodium is supposed to be in the blood okay it's actually what gives us a lot of our osmotic power and our osmotic draw so therefore we hold on to a bunch of that when we start looking at specialized structures like glucose and bicarbonate on a normal day and a normal state we want to keep our bicarbonate buffers we want to keep as much glucose as we can so normally you shouldn't have any of that found in your urine as well okay that's the end of urinary physiology we said just a nice quick one on mostly the homeostatic relationship with urine production and waste removal uh, hopefully you got something out of it so until next time take care